What you're about to hear is an incredible story that many people believe to be true. It's been featured in books, newspaper articles and films. For the first time, we'll talk to the real people behind this story. You can decide the truth. Since the 1940s, the CIA have been developing a top-secret mind-control program known as MKUltra. Its aim was simple, to train and create assassins who would kill with no remorse. These alleged assassins were known as Manchurian candidates. I know the CIA tried to, uh, to find out whether it was possible to have a, a Manchurian candidate, a controlled assassin. So many people believe something like that was possible that somebody had to be looking to see whether it was possible or not. I mean, it's totally off the wall, it's totally true, but it sounds pretty nuts, and it was. I mean, what my government did was crazy. Assassinations have been clearly illegal under American law uh, since uh, 1975, uh, and uh, uh, that executive order was signed by President Ford, and it's still in effect. Uh, there simply hasn't been any uh, uh, effort uh, uh, since that time, I'm sure, to uh, assassinate anyone. time we will reveal the techniques used by the intelligence agencies to turn ordinary American citizens into trained killers. The drugs, the hypnosis and the sinister mind control systems. But perhaps most sensationally of all, we'll talk to the Manchurian candidates themselves. Their story is about the betrayal of the American public. It's a story that many here in Washington hoped would never see the light of day. For the first time, an alleged brainwashed CIA assassin has agreed to tell the world what she says are her terrible secrets, her incredible double life. This is her story. It started when I was a very young child. Um, my father was an assassin. He also was involved in programming children through torture, through mind control, uh, hypnosis and other means. He was wanting to use me as a guinea pig to show his associates, particularly at the CIA, what he could do with one child. So um, I started being trained how to kill when I was four years old. It was back probably starting in the very early 70s, if not earlier. It ended somewhere around 1990. There was over 76 deaths. One time, they had me go in as a prostitute and while the man was in bed, all I had to do was take a scarf that they had already given me to wear and dip it in a toilet. Somehow the water activated the chemical on the scarf and then I just laid it on the man's face and he died. Here comes a candle to light you to bed And here comes a chopper to chop off your head The last, last, last man's head I had what were called Naomi programs that were uh, taught how to dip a pin in like Vaseline that had a chemical on top of the Vaseline in the container and then just scratch somebody with it. 
Guns were so familiar to me, although I was never allowed to have a gun at home. I now have one, and I know how to use it, and I found out the first time I tried to use it, I'm a very good shot without any supposed training. She admitted to us that she'd suffered from multiple personalities, which she says was induced deliberately in her programming. In the early 1950s, the CIA director, Alan Dulles, oversaw a program allegedly to develop brainwashed assassins, codenamed MKUltra. Many observers say it was the CIA's biggest secret until a maverick government officer, John Marks, using some newly released documents, exposed the project to the American public with his book, The Search for the Manchurian Candidate. In the late 1940s, there was a tremendous concern inside the CIA and the U.S. government about the possibilities of, of mind control, of brainwashing, if you will. Uh, there had been a Hungarian cardinal who had stood up at a, at a show trial in Budapest and seemed to be talking robot-like in a kind of a controlled sort of way. And there was a sense, there was a feeling, there was a fear that there was a technology available which allowed people to brainwash people to commit acts against their will. Now the entire purpose of MKUltra was the creation of what they called a Manchurian candidate, which was uh, a a person who could be uh, used to commit an assassination and then made to forget about it afterwards. Researchers have estimated that since the 1950s, thousands of American citizens may have been unwittingly used in this secret program. Alleged victims speak of horrific experiments using hypnosis, drugs and implants, as well as cutting-edge microwave technology. Their aim was simple, to erase the rational mind and create programmed killers. In 1977, the Senate decided to investigate the CIA's activities. However, under scrutiny, the CIA denied that MKUltra was a program to create Manchurian candidates. We tracked down a senior CIA psychologist who is central to MKUltra's activities. Thirty years after John Gittinger's testimony, he admitted to us MKUltra's real purpose. The Manchurian candidate certainly had a great deal to do with the research that we were doing because so many people believed something like that was possible that somebody had to be looking to see whether it was possible or not. You couldn't make laboratory guesses about whether a person would be able to become a controlled assassin. If you really wanted to find out if you could create a controlled assassin, you had to try to create a controlled assassin who would kill people. That was the only way to do it. John Marks claims that in order to maintain secrecy, MKUltra recruited its unwitting guinea pigs from the fringes of society. In the 1950s, Ronald Cohen, who was a political activist and drifter, claims he was one of these unwitting victims. I was hitchhiking outside of Indianapolis because I used to uh, hitchhike back and forth across the United States just like going for a container of milk. I hitchhiked about 100,000, 200,000 miles all over the United States. A gray car pulled up. I got into the car and then I went out, okay? The next thing, I remember highway signs. It said Maryland and we were pulling into a, a U.S. Army barracks, okay? A U.S. Army a major U.S. Army establishment. There was a fence in front of it and it said U.S. Army and this MP came out. So the next thing I, I remember like sort of like just little bits and pieces of what the hell happened. Next thing I re remember like a couple of nurses um, are walking me through like a bunk bed type thing and like what flashed through my mind was like, my God, there's other people here, okay? Ronald Cohen says he found himself in the middle of a massive drug experiment. Without his consent, he was given large doses of LSD. 
Eventually, after 77 days, he claims, the CIA doctors decided he'd served his purpose. The next thing that I remember is it's daytime and I'm in another gray, clean car. He drives up onto the highway and just like, you know, like James Bond, crappy movie, you know, boom, out on the highway and, you know, rolls me out of the car onto the gutter, you know, like here I am, you know, out, right? And, and I mean, I'm stretched out, right? And I remember thinking like, no, my own country, my own country, I'm an American. They don't do this to Americans. From my own research, what, what, this, this was one of the sub-projects of, of the MK Ultra program. I, I couldn't categorically uh, say that it didn't happen. But this did happen to people, didn't it? It did, I guess. Behind me is a top-secret intelligence facility in Montauk, Long Island. Officially, it was an American Air Force base which was decommissioned in 1969 and then reopened as a state park. A state park, however, where the public are barred and which is surrounded by electric fences and motion sensors. Just what is it that they're hiding inside? Many observers allege that the government are really concealing a secret mine control facility. One of the former base workers, Preston Nichols, agreed to be interviewed about the activities on the base. This was the project where we were attempting to control the mind of individuals to make them do things and think things we wanted them to think, basically. And it was done using 435 megahertz UHF signals, pulse type carrier signal. The Montauk Project boys part of it, which actually came out of MK Ultra and the Monarch Project, was definitely programming kids very similar to a Manchurian candidate. They can make an individual that is extremely easy to program and send them out to be assassin or send them out as a super soldier, whatever, whatever they want. It wasn't until the mid to late 70s that I realized there was an actual mind control going on. By that point, I was in it so deep, I couldn't get out. Preston Nichols monitors the base in his bus. We asked him to show us some evidence to back up his incredible claims. He says that electrical signals still coming out of the disused base are proof that mind control experiments are still going on. Preston, what is this we can hear now? Well, this is a signal that shows us they're alive and working and operating. It's at 435 megahertz pulse type FM modulation. This is underground at the Montauk base, about a half a mile to a quarter, quarter to a half a mile down. All that remains of the original Montauk base are some gutted out buildings, a disused radar tower and the entire area around me is strewn with abandoned electrical equipment, generators and cables. Many people say that this is a carefully worked illusion designed to give you the impression that there's nothing at all going on here and designed to take your focus away from the real secret of the area, the underground base 300 yards in that direction. Montauk today is known officially as the Camp Hero State Park. They keep it closed to the public and they just don't talk about what's going on and there is basically nothing above ground that will give them away. You've got to look at many more projects than just what's going on here at Montauk Point. 
because this mind control technology, Manchurian candidate technologies, is so diversified that they're now all over the world. They're being done from the satellite. They're being done from transmitters or parallel TV stations. You know, this is so diversified. As we were filming, it was clear that we were being watched. A security patrol drew up and we were informed that this was government property and told in no uncertain terms to leave immediately. I have been approached by clandestine forces and I basically publicized and wrote about the project for my protection. See, the idea here is if half of the population of a million people knows of me and the project, I now invoke what's known as a martyrdom clause, where if anything happens to me, I become a martyr and there'd be 10,000 people digging up Montauk Point, which they don't want. Colin Ross is a psychiatrist who treats victims who say they were part of the experimental stages of MKUltra. He sifted through thousands of MKUltra documents that have been released through the Freedom of Information Act. He says that CIA documents clearly state that they did experiment with advanced forms of hypnosis to possibly create Manchurian candidates. And these experiments that were being done describe several different things. One is creating new identities using hypnosis and other methods that would stand up on a lie detector test successfully and also creating new identities that would carry out tasks under hypnosis for which the person was amnesic. So these are real life simulations in which a woman will go from one room to another, retrieve a document, bring it back and come out of the hypnotic sleep with no memory of what she's done. Did you use hypnosis to create Manchurian candidates? We did a lot of work to try to find out whether it's possible to hypnotize somebody against their will. We were never able to do it. Therefore, the idea of the Manchurian candidate did not seem to me and to the people that I was working with as something that was possible to do. Now, I understand there are a lot of people who feel differently. While in Washington, we were approached by a man claiming to have inside knowledge of the MKUltra program. He agreed to give us classified information, providing his identity wasn't disclosed. He told me that in the early stages of MKUltra, Manchurian candidates were used as patsies to take the fall for assassinations. He said to find evidence of this, we had to look no further than the most famous assassination of all time. November 22nd, 1963, was perhaps the darkest hour of American history. The most popular and charismatic president this century, John F. Kennedy, was shot dead as he drove through Dallas in an open limousine. Lee Harvey Oswald was arrested and charged with his murder, but investigators now suspect that a team of highly trained assassins were actually responsible for this shooting. Were the intelligence services so threatened by Kennedy that they ordered the unthinkable, an assassination of their own chief executive? Lee Harvey Oswald was arrested for the murder of President Kennedy. He claimed at the time that he was innocent. Many people now believe that the lone gunman theory was pure invention to hide the fact that there were other gunmen involved. They say Oswald's calmness after the shooting and his dazed, almost hypnotized state at his arrest have all the hallmarks of an early Manchurian candidate. 
was Oswald programmed to take the fall. A leading author on Kennedy's assassination believes this could be the case. Well, it's not impossible that he could have been hypnotized or programmed or through power of uh, post-hypnotic suggestion uh, to be in the right place. Lee Harvey Oswald, if not the first Manchurian candidate, was one of the first Manchurian candidates used by the CIA. He was also a failure, and they realized that they were going to have to dispose with the whole plan, and other shooters entered the scene. One of the MK Ultra sites was at Tsuki Air Force Base in Japan, and then Lee Harvey Oswald was stationed there at one time. And he was in the hospital for a while to have his tonsils taken out, and it was during that time that a very crude implant was inserted into his head. Uh, the, the implant malfunctioned, right? So he couldn't operate as an assassin himself, but he could still be used as a patsy. By 1968, in the Robert Kennedy assassination, these processes had been perfected. His assailant moves in from the right. Yeah, there is the lead. He's been shot. He's been shot. Many people believe that the truth died with Oswald. However, we've tracked down a CIA insider who claims he was privy to the agency's most sensitive operations. He told us that Oswald was in fact a programmed assassin set up by a rogue element of the CIA. Their problem became that he was under the control of some uh, branch or, or faction of the CIA that uh, the CIA itself didn't know about. Helmuth Scherer was too afraid to say who the rogue faction were, but some allege that the ex-CIA director, Alan Dulles, who implemented MKUltra and who Kennedy had fired, could have been involved. Alan Dulles was one of a select group of men chosen by Lyndon Johnson to form the Warren Commission to investigate Kennedy's death. Despite some evidence to the contrary, Dulles and his colleagues concluded that Oswald acted on his own. Five years on, Robert Kennedy began his campaign for the presidency of the United States. Unwilling to accept the Warren Commission's conclusions, some say he promised to reinvestigate his brother's death if elected. Observers believe it was a promise that many in Washington couldn't face. On the 5th of June 1968, Robert Kennedy was celebrating in a hotel after receiving his presidential nomination. His election looked certain. After making his speech, Kennedy left the rally through the pantry of the hotel. At the same time, a man with a gun made his way through the crowd to where Kennedy was. He opened fire, fatally wounding Kennedy and injuring several other people. The assassin, Sahan Sahan, was immediately held and arrested. Many now believe he could have been a Manchurian candidate. It took six men to pry that gun out of Sir Han's hand because he was in a hypnotic trance. Six men, including Rosie Greer, the football player. So then when it was all over, he couldn't remember. He still can't remember what happened. That's a Manchurian candidate. We tracked down one of the FBI agents who was on the scene soon after the assassination and asked him if the evidence pointed towards this conclusion. Sirhan could have been hypnotized, he could have been a Manchurian candidate programmed to assassinate Bobby Kennedy and, and I do think that there is a fair amount of validity to that theory. This theory has been supported by an eyewitness who was in the pantry of the hotel at the time of the assassination. Scott Enyard, who was taking photographs at the rally, told us that it was evident that Sahan Sahan was hypnotized. Uh, they talk about his wild-eyed stare when he was taken into custody, and I photographed him as he was being taken down the, down the staircase to a police car. He absolutely looked like, you know, deer in the headlights type of a thing, you know, sort of manic. To this day, Sirhan Sirhan protests his innocence. Many allege that he was programmed to fire at Kennedy while a second assassin discharged the fatal shots. The question is, were signs of the MKUltra pattern emerging again? Send in a programmed patsy with a gun while the real assassins make sure of the kill 
leaving the patsy behind to take the fall. For this theory to work, we had to find evidence of a second gunman. The police there found more bullets in the walls than were in his gun, so how do you account for the, for the killing of Robert Kennedy? Well, there were powder burns on his neck, right? Because somebody standing behind him had, had pulled the trigger. The implications are that there was another gun in the pantry at the time of the shooting and that it was fired. According to Scott Enyard, a closer examination of the murder scene reveals that Sahan Sahan's bullets could not have killed Kennedy. The coroner, Thomas Noguchi, concluded that Kennedy was killed with bullets fired from behind, but Sahan Sahan was standing no less than three feet in front of him. So who could have fired the fatal shots? Scott Enyard claims that a security guard standing inches behind Kennedy would have been in the right place to inflict the wounds. The security guard got up off the floor after Kennedy fell on him, ripping his tie off on the way down. Uh, when I saw him stand up, which is when I put my camera down, his gun was out. The point is, is we have complete disagreement between the coroner, Dr. Thomas Noguchi, and the LAPD. Dr. Noguchi was not even allowed to testify at the trial. Dr. Noguchi did a film recreation to try to show how Sirhan could have shot him and couldn't do it. No matter how he moved the people around, no matter how he twisted things around, he could not make that work. Scott Enyard says his photographs were crucial in determining whether there was another gunman behind Kennedy. Immediately after the assassination, the LAPD confiscated the photographs. Inexplicably, they were never presented in court as evidence, but were sealed for 20 years in the police archive. In 1995, Scott Enyard sued the LAPD for their return. The court eventually ordered them to comply. It seems as the courier drove to the courthouse with the photographs, somehow they were stolen from his car. The only evidence that could have exposed the MK Ultra link was lost forever. Bobby Kennedy had mentioned to people that uh, were he to be uh, nominated and run for president, the first thing that he would do was reopen the investigation into the death of his brother. And these are the kinds of things that for political reasons just could not happen. And so however he ended up dead, whether it was by Sirhan or whether it was going to be two weeks later by somebody else, there were definitely forces at work in this country and from around the world that wanted that man dead. The assassination of John Lennon in New York in 1980 may also be linked to MKUltra. In the last few years, rumours have persisted that John Lennon may have been assassinated by a Manchurian candidate. This culminated in John Lennon's son, Sean, alleging that his father was murdered by a CIA assassin. President Richard Nixon and his administration were fixated by what they called the Lennon problem. To them, John Lennon was the worst kind of political activist and he spent much of his time under constant surveillance by the FBI. The accused, Mark David Chapman, was reportedly inspired by the classic American novel, The Catcher in the Rye. Many believe that the book is a post-hypnotic trigger to set Manchurian candidates into action. In John Lennon's assassination, it's alleged that the doorman from the Dakota Flats where Lennon lived reported that after the shooting, Chapman stood calmly by, reading a copy of The Catcher in the Rye until the police arrived to arrest him. I believe that the contents of The Catcher in the Rye contain trigger words and may actually have, have been used for some purpose in his programming. Now, the book itself was written by a former OSS officer. The book, Catcher in the Rye, has turned up in several assassinations since. So it's therefore logical to believe that it had some role in, in the assassin programming. Several weeks ago, I went to a public library and I saw Catcher in the Rye on the shelf and immediately I went into a trance. And I kept staring at it and I finally was able to get enough control of myself to pull that book out and open it. And when I saw what it was about, I realized how perfect that book would be for somebody to use on someone who 
had a problem as far as perhaps an attachment disorder where they are not able to bond with people and emotionally connect with people. And to me, that would be the perfect type person to use as a patsy for an assassination. In parallel to the hypnosis part of the program, the CIA and military scientists were working on technology which could be implanted in the brains of potential Manchurian candidates. Was this the holy grail that the men from MKUltra were looking for? The Office of Naval Research in the 50s and 60s funded research where brain electrode implants were put into human beings. This was also funded by the Army and the CIA. Using government funding, Jose Delgado at Yale University developed a radio transmitter device which he put into the brain of a bull. We obtained this footage which chillingly shows the future direction of the MKUltra program. Dr. Delgado, who can clearly be seen standing in the ring, stops the bull in his tracks every time he activates the radio transmitter. Crude but effective mind control. So it's a scientific fact that you can put a brain electrode in somebody's head, you can stimulate that electrically from a remote distance and that will have a dramatic effect on their behavior. Many people allege that CIA scientists like Delgado quickly moved on to implant these same transmitters into human beings. Our contact within the CIA gave us the name of a Swedish victim, Robert Naisland, who claims that he was experimentally implanted by his secret police, Sapo, as part of the MKUltra program. We flew to Stockholm where he told us his incredible story. Uh, the first time I got involved in this uh, technology or very implanted were at the uh, hospital during an operation here in Stockholm where the surgeon implanted a transmitter in my right nostril during the operation. I were implanted with radio transmitters, uh, big like uh, of the size of a small bullet and as we can see of the x-rays. Every general practitioner can see that there's something wrong with those x-rays. The implants are shown very, very clearly. And of course, how they were put there, you can't say from an x-ray, but you can see that it was an implant, something that does not belong to the x-ray. Dr. Kilder, a former acting chief medical officer for Finland, firmly believes that Naisland was used in covert mind control experiments. It's very easy if you implant into the brain, it can be done through the nostrils. It's like, like a, a sinus puncture actually almost. Or of course you can have a drill into the skull straight ahead. Uh, but nowadays the implants have become very sophisticated, very small, and they are often put into the backs of the people because they do not show in autopsies. Robert Naisland believes that he was implanted with at least five transmitters in a series of operations at a secret Stockholm hospital. Since then, he says he's been aware of people secretly monitoring his movements. He claims the implants drove him to criminal and antisocial behavior. Finally, in despair, he sought out the help of a radiologist who was prepared to x-ray his alleged implants. He sent these x-rays to a famous Swedish medic, Dr. Lindström, who was practicing in America. Lindström replied that the x-rays confirmed the presence of transmitters. After having them removed, he took the devices to a laboratory in New York to have the implants examined. But uh, when I returned, about 10 days later on, uh, when they had told me to come back, they had lost the transmitter. They had lost this piece which were removed there from my head in Athens. So, who do you think took the transmitter? Well, I think that any security against the, either CIA or the Swedish SEPO must have been involved in this, uh, in this uh, thing when my transmitter were loosed. 
Mainstream scientists and especially medical doctors know nothing about this technology. It's been well kept a uh, secret within the military because in NATO countries, I live in Norway now, military intelligence, that is for instance, electronic surveillance project of the Navy is doing implants on people in Norway. Uh, the same is done of course all over the world like in the US. Observers say that MKUltra's mind control didn't just stop at implants. The latest research is reported to include the use of high-frequency microwave beams. The claim is that these waves transmit sounds straight into the brain. Back in 1992, over the holidays, I was sound asleep one night in, in my apartment, and I was suddenly awakened out of a very deep sleep. Uh, I found that unusual because though I was uh, very relaxed, I was extremely alert mentally. When all of a sudden, I very distinctly and quite clearly heard a voice say matter-of-factly in my right ear, the underground bases are real. Sorda is a researcher who investigates the covert actions of the CIA and the other intelligence agencies. He discovered that a device to broadcast voices into people's heads did in fact exist. Recently, I've discovered uh, that a patent was granted in 1989 uh, to do just that, to broadcast an intelligible voice right into the auditory cortex. The technology by which this, this uh, voice can be broadcast in, into the human mind is very straightforward. A person speaks into a microphone. Uh, the, the, what they say is then transmitted via a, a plurality of microwaves into the target individual where that person then hears the voice as if it were speaking in their ear, in their inner ear, as it were, uh, with, very clearly. And this is what happened to me. I'm thoroughly persuaded of that. There's no doubt in my mind. At a Washington hotel, we met up with a man who had a neurophone, a sophisticated device which could enable commands to be directly transmitted into the heads of Manchurian candidates. He demonstrated its incredible abilities to us inside a locked hotel room. He told us that in the wrong hands, it could be used to create brainwashed assassins. Unfortunately, we were unable to demonstrate it on television because he claimed it was a classified intelligence device. In 1991, an inmate at an obscure Utah prison filed charges against prison staff alleging that they had used him in sophisticated mind control experiments. In affidavits submitted for the case, the prisoners testified to a whole series of advanced forms of mind control experiments being carried out. For several years now, I've been subjected to the influence of some type of device or technology that causes me to receive voice transmissions in my head, just as if I had little radio speakers in my inner ears. Several of the inmates submitted similar experiences as affidavits to the court. The inmate who was representing himself couldn't gather enough proof against Utah State prisons, and eventually the case was dismissed by the judge, citing lack of evidence. Our Washington informant gave me one final incredible piece of information. If we wanted proof to see if MKUltra was still active today, he said we should investigate the Oklahoma bombing, and specifically the background of the terrorist Timothy McVeigh. In 1995, in Oklahoma City, ex-Army colleagues Terry Nichols and Tim McVeigh bombed a federal building housing different law enforcement agencies. The enormous car bomb killed 168 people. McVeigh was sentenced to death and is currently on death row, while Nichols was sentenced to life imprisonment. The immediate question was why did McVeigh commit the biggest terrorist act on American soil? The official story is that when he was in the army, he became frustrated and depressed because he couldn't make the special forces. He goes to work at Calspan, and after a year, 
he suddenly becomes enraged at the United States government because he, he believed that he had an implant in his body. Well, what was Calspan? The company that he was working for was a top secret microelectronics firm, as a matter of fact, that began at Cornell. Days after McVeigh was arrested, the Boston Globe interviewed his closest friends. They said that McVeigh had complained about having been implanted by the government. So could Calspan, as Alex Constantine alleges, be a site for MKUltra? And if so, was McVeigh an implanted Manchurian candidate? Although McVeigh has already been sentenced to death by a federal court, pressure from the local population has forced Oklahoma District Attorney Bob Macy to set up a state grand jury. The reason for calling a grand jury, this local grand jury that's been in session now for many months, was to determine if there was a wider conspiracy than just McVeigh and Nichols. And so for months now we've been taking testimony from anyone who claimed to have knowledge that uh, there was any broader conspiracy or that there were any other individuals involved. But secondly, to see uh, they claimed that, that there was uh, information that federal employees had been notified ahead of time that there was going to be a bombing that day and they shouldn't go to work. You may be aware that McVeigh claims that an implant was put inside his body. Do you think this is relevant at all to your investigation? No, I'm, I'm absolutely unaware that he ever made any such allegation. Uh, it would have been literally impossible for this to have happened. But this is the first time I've heard an alle any allegation having to do with having implants or anything of that nature. The Oklahoma grand jury are still deliberating the facts of the case before it goes back into open court, where McVeigh's MKUltra links might be finally tested. In the last few years, MKUltra victims have begun to speak out. Victims of mind control experimentation, along with psychiatrists and therapists, have formed an organization called AICS. They're campaigning for the government to reinvestigate the ongoing mind control programs. In 1995, two alleged MKUltra survivors testified before a presidential committee investigating the misuse of American citizens in covert scientific experiments. In listening to the testimony today, it all sounds really familiar. I am here to talk about a possible link between radiation and mind control. President Clinton mandate a presidential inquiry of mind control experimentation. I was subjected to mind control experimentation during the Cold War era in the 1950s. And I'm a citizen of the United States. I've been a victim of mind control experimentation since 19. I am also an American citizen living in Canada who was a victim of the MK Ultra program in the 1960s. I was a victim of mind control from New Orleans, Louisiana. I demand that the President of the United States appoint an advisory committee to look into... I, at 14 and 6 years of age, underwent uh, two unwitting mind control experimental procedures involving brain tissue removal. I'd like to convey my concerns to the President of the United States, Mr. Bill Clinton. As a child, I was subjected to um, mind control experimentation that has, uh, is continuing today. As a citizen of the United States, I demand that a presidential inquiry and a commission... demand that there be a presidential inquiry into the CIA's mind control projects. I was born in 1975, and I was an unwilling participant in these heinous crimes. This stuff has to stop. It's against all laws, codes, and moral ethics known to man. Please do something. President Clinton made this apology for the radiation experiments carried out on the American people. Thousands of government-sponsored experiments did take place at hospitals, universities, and military bases around our nation. Some were unethical, not only by today's standards, but by the standards of the time in which they were conducted. They failed both the test of our national values and the test of humanity. The United States of America offers a sincere apology to those of our citizens who were subjected to these experiments, 
to their families, and to their communities. When the government does wrong, we have a moral responsibility to admit it. The duty we owe to one another to tell the truth and to protect our fellow citizens from excesses like these is one we can never walk away from. I thought I lived a very boring life. I knew I was tired all the time. I was just exhausted. I had a lot of nightmares that I could not explain. I didn't know that I had another life, really probably several other lives that I was living. The American people should definitely be concerned about this, but most of them are oblivious to it. Most of the American people just have their can of beer, their bowl of uh, potato chips and watch the Super Bowl. You know, George Orwell painted a very, um, a very uh, troubling future for human society uh, globally in 1984. Here we are in 1998, and the technologies that I see are scarier by far than George Orwell's uh, worst nightmare. I think it is the biggest threat to humanity, and it's been going on for maybe 50 years. In an undisclosed warehouse somewhere near Washington, the CIA stores all their classified records and files. A complete history of their covert operations. Bowing to public pressure, President Clinton has ordered the CIA to declassify its top secret records that are more than 25 years old. The CIA has demanded certain exemptions from this disclosure. The real truth about MKUltra rests with a group of CIA agents who are currently sifting through these archives to decide what will and what won't be released to the American public. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to Youth Orbs Disclosure Channel for weekly UFO and Orb sightings. Since the beginning of time, some ancient mysteries have never been solved. To take an unforgettable journey where no one has dared to go for thousands of years. Until now. giants in the earth in those days, and when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children, the same became mighty men, which were of old. Regardless of race, region, religion, or age, every society has created legends about giants. Incas of South America believed a race of giants existed on Earth before the Great Flood. So did many other ancient civilizations. Some took them for gods, others left likenesses of them in stone or wrote about them in their histories. The Greeks and Romans told of blood falling from heaven and landing in the lap of the Earth goddess Gaia, who gave birth to the Titans. 
a race of fearsome giants.